Oh, it's January 8th and it is very cold today. Like most of the country, we are in a uh, deep freeze from an Arctic blast. I think the high today was only 18, so we're in a lot better shape than the Midwest, but it's still pretty cold. Uh, so I'm not gonna be out here too long, but I just wanted to show you uh, what I picked up. Um, actually, well, I did pick up this truck. This is a new, uh, a new addition to the herd of Dodges. This is a, a Dodge Dakota. Um, so it's my first small truck. Um, I'm probably going to end up bidding the uh, the '93 Chevy Diesel. Let's probably send that on down the road, and because uh, we got too many trucks. I know some guys probably think there's never too many trucks. Of course, we're going to keep the big dog, uh, the 5.9 liter Cummins, the one ton Duali, because uh, that, that pulls our fifth wheel. So we definitely want to keep that. But that's not what I came out here in the freezing cold to show you. I wanted to show you what I picked up today. I picked up this uh, this cream puff little compressor here. I don't need another air compressor and that's not why I bought it. This ancient looking little ugly compressor came up on eBay and it was uh, for local pickup only because of the weight. The guy didn't want to deal with shipping it. And he kept listing it for I think 30 bucks or best offer and nobody was taking him up on it and uh it, you know it's got this this I don't know if i can see the brand on it i forgot hold on a second uh, a little wooden uh skid with the casters on it on one side broke off but uh this is a binks binks manufacturing compressor it's a spray painting equipment now i've never seen one a compressor with a setup like this there's no pressure switch that I can see so it appears what happens is this little compressor this little uh, single cylinder compressor must compress this air in this tank and then it's got this strange vertical device right here I'm not even sure what the heck this thing is but anyways uh, I could care less uh, matter of fact I'm probably end up scrapping the thing what I wanted was the motor. What I realized was that this thing had a vintage 120 volt GE electric motor on it, an early one. And I immediately thought of my Atlas Lathe project. I thought, you know, I'd like to get, I was thinking I'd like to get a motor that was more true to the vintage of that lathe and um, didn't want to spend a lot of money. And I was looking and every time a vintage motor came up on, uh, eBay they you know typically brought anywhere from 30 to 60 dollars so I figured since I do local pickup and everything I would do a deal with the with the, the guy who had this and I went and picked this up for 20 bucks today and he said he had the motor running but he wasn't sure he didn't want to leave it running long so we tried to plug it in when I was there and what ended up happening was there was a big spark and it blew the circuit breaker because the wiring on the bat on the end here was so bad at the plug I tried stripping off the the insulation here and rewiring the plug several times while I was there and every time I would strip it the insulation would just crumble and bare wires would be exposed so there was no way I was going to make it work so I said you know what I'm going to take it on his word that this thing was running and I'm going to take a chance and for 20 bucks I popped on this and if nothing else it makes a, uh, a good whippy cushion So he says, oh, you're, you're into motors? Oh, I got more motors here. And we, he shows me where there's a couple of more motors piled up. And I, I dig through the pile. And here's the first motor I pull out. An Atlas motor. <laughs> what are the odds on that? So this is a bigger motor than the last one. But what's kind of cool is it's an Atlas Press Company. It says right on the Atlas Press Company motor. So um, this is uh, definitely a motor off of uh, a piece of Atlas equipment. Not sure. It's it's a double-ended shaft, so I'm not sure what it was running. Um, and when I pulled it out of the pile, it was a bunch of stuff piled underneath there. I didn't get it all the way out. I grabbed onto the cord, and the cord came out and had just nothing on it. And he says, yeah, I think we uh, just pushed those wires into the outlet to see if it would work. So we had an extension cord handling, and I pushed the wires in there, and lo and behold, it uh, it didn't work. So... But then I'm, I'm like, boy, an Atlas motor? I, I really still want the thing. So I uh, said, well, I tell you, I'll, I'll take it the way it is for five bucks. 
And, and he said, uh, yeah, okay, he could do that because we both knew, I actually called and verified to make sure, but we both knew the scrap value on this motor for the scrap metal guy is 15 cents a pound. This would be considered low grade. And this is a low-grade electrical motor. They only get 15 cents a pound on it. So my five bucks was a fair, fair offer for scrap. And um, actually above scrap. You think about it, 15 cents goes into a dollar more than five times. So uh, every five pounds of motor is worth less than one dollar. I paid him five dollars. So that's uh, over 25 pounds of motor I would have bought. And this isn't that heavy of a motor. So anyways, after we made the deal and I unburied all the other stuff and pulled it out, what comes out? A second cord with a plug on it. And at that point, uh, we didn't care to test it because the deal was done. And I just, I'm just going to take it and see what happens. But we talked about it and he said the nearest he could figure is that maybe this came off of a piece of equipment that had a light on it, like a drill press or something. And maybe the deal was that the, uh, you know, the... Uh, the motor because there's a switch right here so anyway so what we're going to do is we're going to make sure these wires aren't touching and plug this in and see what happens because it'd be funny if this works okay so i just plugged into my extension cord which is live and nothing happened so let's flip the switch <laughs> so we got sounds like maybe a noisy bearing there Bearings are a little noisy, but it's a runner. Oh yeah, bearings are definitely singing. So, it also, yeah, you hear how that, uh, how quickly that spun down? So we're going to have to see. Chances are we get that little screw right there. I think if we take that out and put a little oil in there, and take that screw out put a little oil in there, we might be on to something. I love it. Well, back to work on the Atlas lathe tonight. Boy, I gotta tell you, things down here in the basement are just kind of getting out of control. I've got uh, a bunch of insulation that I started putting in down the other end of the basement there. I finished my lighting down there. So hopefully once I get all that insulation in and the lighting in, I can get my shelving all set up and permanently situated and get some of this stuff out of here so I can walk around. It's just getting uh, a little too unruly. The Hindi is where I last left it. I still got to get that moved over, got to get that over there, get the rollaway toolbox out of the way, get it under that beam so I can lift it, chip pan sitting here, the new welder's sitting here, this whole area needs to be cleaned up, <laughs> base for the SIP drill press, uh, I really got to get going here because uh, this is not, not copacetic at all, I can't even find my tripod, it's such a mess down here. So, anyways, uh, I'm going to reattach the headstock onto the lathe, and uh, it's pretty easy to figure out which way this goes because there's two bolt holes here that go up into th two threaded blind holes on this end. And then on this end, there's this part right here, so that's going to slide in through here. And then uh, we're just going to have to see whether or not there's any kind of alignment to deal with there. I would imagine that could be critical. Well, that's actually a pretty tight fit right here on the end in between the ways. So that kind of keeps this from moving on the back here. On the front, I can't see it to move it at all, so I think that's going to be okay. And then as far as where exactly it's supposed to be, I've actually got this kind of a ghost image left behind here. So I'm going to just bring that right up to the line. like right there I think should do it and we'll see if we can't get those bolts in all right turns out that was just a hair too far forward I uh, had to give it a couple little taps and I uh, was able to get this bolt to start all right I guess I just tightened this three-quarter inch head uh, bolt and uh, again it looks like I don't have to worry about alignment this way or that way because again it this is just it's machined so tight that it just fits in there Okay, I'm not going to reinstall the spindle at this time because I haven't cleaned that spindle and pulley assembly yet. Matter of fact, the chuck is still on and I need to get the chuck off of it. I think now I'll get the uh, carriage assembly over here and disassemble that and clean it. 
because uh, I've got everything off the shelving that I had to move to do my insulating and everything. Uh, the workbench is complete chaos. I mean, uh, much worse than usual. I don't have one square inch, I think, to spare over there. So I'm going to have to work on this right here on the uh, top of the parts washer. So let's take a quick look at what we've got here. Fresh my memory, yeah, what we've got to deal with here. Okay, we've got uh, originally this lathe would have come with a um, what they call a lantern style tool post. And what's on here right now is a, a homemade fabbed up tool post with a, a cutter in it. Let me turn this around. Okay, so we've got a cutting tool in there, it's clamped in. Not a bad little job on this little tool post here but we're going to remove that first and then uh, we've got this this strange handle on the um, on the compound <laughs> uh, now it looks like I know what the original handle is supposed to look like on the compound and it looks like it might be there and I think maybe this is just something that was a homemade thing that was fabbed up to uh, to use to give more leverage when using this uh, so let's see if we can't take that off and I'm hoping that the handle underneath there is intact and not broken we've got a little sheet metal cover here that looks like that is factory okay and that protects the lead screw from chips and stuff falling down in it and it's held on by one screw which was loose enough that I was able to pull that right off and then, of course, we've got the handle. You can see this is the original hand wheel, but uh, the previous owner fabricated this makeshift handle repair using a crank window crank handle off of a, a old car. Uh, check that uh, window crank. Oh, well, I'm glad to see the original handle is here and, and does appear completely intact. So I think that was just this is just something he put on there to give him more leverage because he didn't like dealing with this little this little handle. Uh, this is a really early nine inch model. Um, they only made this one for two or three years with this style handle or maybe even less I don't know for sure. And then they changed this to a little ball crank handle which would give you much more uh, leverage and you know you can grab that little ball crank and get a little more force. So this didn't last very long. All right, so loosening this Allen screw a little bit would allow you to swivel this around if you wanted to change the angle that this was, was mounted on. But then if you loosen it enough, you could slide this right out. That looks like it's probably the original T-nut that went in here. So I think you know, the holder here and this aluminum disc right here as a spacer, that's um, you know all fabbed up, but I think this part right here this t-nut is original now I think in the piles and piles of stuff that I uh, I got for free out of that uh, estate with the lathes I think I came across a box that had a lantern style tool post in it and so with a little luck it might even be the original one for this lathe uh, I'm definitely gonna hold on to this in the meantime because I'm probably gonna initially uh, use this setup that he had on there to do some test cuts with it Alright, I'm not really sure how to uh, move this. I see a couple of nuts here. Oh, bolt heads, I guess. That must be how you take the uh, must be how you take the compound. I think this is called the compound rest. Um, looks like this is how you take it off of the uh, little part of the cross slide that travels. Now this is really interesting to me. That's a nut. So. I can't unscrew the nut very far before it hits the underside of the compound, so I don't know. I guess I'm supposed to unscrew, loosen this nut on this side and loosen them both a little at a time as I pull up on it. Well, I mean, obviously you loosen the two of them a little bit so that you can actually reset the uh, angle, um, but I'm thinking that you just keep taking them looser and looser on both sides and that you'll be able to pull they should be able to pull this right off yeah that worked that was pretty straightforward so is there a pin under there yeah there's a pin under there that that rides in take those nuts out before they get lost all right 
So that sticks down in there. And then you got these two these two nuts. I wonder if these are captive. I wonder if there's a spot where you slide these two that makes them want to come out. Well, if there is, I don't see it right now. All right. So the next question is, I wonder how the cross slide here comes off of the uh, carriage or the saddle part of the carriage here. I just was cranking this that way just for the heck of it to see what would happen. It, it just dumped out a whole bunch of crud and it looks like it just keeps right on coming. So I'm wonder if it's just as simple as just literally unscrewing this. I think I just did. Alright, so I've got this disengaged enough so that all right, I can just keep turning this, it's not moving anymore. So in other words, this uh, nut, uh, I forget what you call this, but that's completely off of the end of the screw, but I can't slide this off. So I don't know if it's just stuck. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a, uh, I'm gonna get a dead blow mallet so I can gently tap at that and see if it goes. And if it doesn't, you know what, maybe before I even try that, maybe I should uh, get some screws here that I'm not sure about what they do. This thing's so filthy. So what I see is this large screw head right here. Looks like that pretty, it's pretty clear that that holds in the nut. The, uh, the lead screw nut. So I don't think taking that off is going to do anything for me because that looks like that's already ready to come right out. This screw right here appears to hold on this end piece. And again, I can't fathom what that's going to... Oh, okay. Hold on a second. All right, my rubber mallet. Just tapping with my rubber mallet and that's clearly coming out. So that's just stuck on there it's tight I bet you there were a bunch of guys who know how these come apart that were watching me do this just now and were going I can't believe he's doing that because <laughs> what ended up happening was when I I got this off I then had this piece fall out which I think is a jib and these little brass pieces right here fell out and there's two I'm assuming there's a third one because I think what we've got going here is these three allen headed screws with lock nuts they must be for adjusting this jib to compensate for wear on the slide here so I probably was supposed to loosen those three screws up and then this thing probably would have slid off like butter all right, well, I'm happy to report I did find all three of those. And I was worried about which one went where. Uh, but then it occurred to me that I'm going to probably be resetting all of these screws when I'm putting this back together. As far as how the jib goes in, well, I could tell which side is the uh, side that's facing this, those little pushing uh, points there because it's got these little divots in it. So those brass things must go in those holes and push on this, okay. All right. Now I can see there's a nice square hole right here. So if I slide that, uh, these are the two bolts that are sticking up to hold the uh, compound on. If I slide that just, it's just right into into the exact position there, I can probably drop them out. They are sticking. Boy, I'll tell you, those screws do not want to move very easily. It's funny when you have them just in the right position and it was swiveling, it seemed to move okay. But I'm just trying to move them here. They keep getting stuck. I don't know if the inside of that track has got damage on it from, clamp from the clamping force of that being tightened over the years or what? 
I'm gonna try and put this uh, compound back on and see if it swivels. Well, that's an enigma. Can't get these to come out. They don't want to slide over there. And I look at this really closely. It almost looks like this disc part right here is pressed onto this center part right here. I'm thinking that might actually come out. But I sure as heck don't want to put any force on there. I mean, that's that, that's that Zamic material. Uh, probably run the risk of cracking it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean that up the way it is. I'm going to keep that as an assembly and clean that the way it is. And then after it's cleaned up, get a better look at it and see if I can't figure out what's going on.